So I mentioned before the break about um, asking you about uh, this abolitionist perspective that you're coming from. Well, you call yourself a full on abolitionist, am I correct? Yes, that's right. Now, has that always, once you started getting involved in movement work, grassroots work, was that always the perspective you were coming from or is that something that evolved over time? I definitely evolved into an abolitionist, but I will say that the minute I was offered abolitionist theory, I ate it up. And that's because I grew up in a neighborhood full of LAPD. I grew up in a community where the cops did nothing but decimate and destroy my family and my neighborhoods. I, you know, started going to to jails and juvenile halls really early. My 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 brother, who is my first best friend, ended up in juvenile hall at 15. And you know, I was receiving those letters and um at a young age. And so a, a growing rage and um and also disappointment. Like, is this really how we're gonna treat like this child? And I remember you know being a child and, and thinking about like he's just a kid like why is he being taken away in handcuffs? Like, why is he, no one has been harmed, like no one's hurt and yet he's being harmed and hurt. And so when I, you know, did my first workshop, it was through Critical Resistance, which is a national organization that still exists, abolitionist organization, and it was in LA and they were doing a workshop on abolition. And I remember going to the workshop and learning about what is called the prison industrial complex. and. I was like, wait a second, prisons are, it's an industry? And from there was like, yeah, no, this, I I definitely want to abolish this. I think in my abolitionist sort of evolution though, I started to realize like, yes, abolition is about police and prisons, but there's so much more to it. There's so much more we should be talking about when it comes to abolition. Um, and that would happen, I would say, probably in the last decade. Mm-hmm. Um, you and for people who are listening, you define abolition as the um, as the abolishing of a system, practice, or or institution. Yes. Why do you think this concept of abolition frightens people? Because we are comfortable, um, even though if a thing isn't working, you know, we're creatures of habit. It's a, a lot of it is very um you know physiological we're creatures of habit we're used to a thing change is very hard and i think you know um and and sorry abolitionists out there don't get mad at me i think that we have failed to really tell people how you can be an abolitionist how you can use it how it can be implemented we talked a lot about abolition we've called for abolition but we haven't said, okay, what replaces it? Um, really important story that just came out in the New York Times about a prison here in California, Susanville. And I know that prison well. My uh, father was in that prison. My uncle was in that prison. One of my mentees was in that prison. It's 11 hours north of Los Angeles. And it's in a little military town. Like a, it's a, like a for real prison town. It's kind of the only industry in the town. What's being shut down, great. We love it as abolitionists. And that means that there is an economy that is being shut down, which means that people are not going to have jobs. And so when we're talking about abolition, we should also be talking about, okay, well, if we're going to get rid of prisons, what else? What do we do? What, and what's the process? You know, as an abolitionist, I'm not saying release everybody overnight or stop policing overnight. I'm actually saying, how do we reinvest the industry, right? Like if we're in this small town that used to be an agricultural town, that's now a prison town, what do we offer this community so they can still sustain their lives since this prison sustained their lives? It impacted others and sustained other people's lives. So I really do think that there is a conversation here that takes not just me or you, but all of us to reimagine what world we want to live in. I don't want to live in a prison town. I've visited those prison towns. It's pretty depressing. But what would it mean if it was a town that really valued gardening and community services and care and after school programs? It would be a very different place. It also means that you would have to retrain people. People have been trained to be overseers. So how do you retrain a population to care for human beings differently than what they've just been doing? 
because I, I believe that's the issue, um, one of the many issues with Angola in Louisiana, like which is, you know, been pretty much number one on the on the pop charts as worst prison in America for a long for a long time. But that community is completely dependent, dependent. on yes, on this prison. So um, I think most people in this country don't realize that our prison system, because uh, we have the largest one in the world, right? We incarcerate yep. more people than anybody else, even yep. more than China, which they love to bring up all the time. <laughs> um, and so they're like, China's the worst, really? You sure? Because we got a lot of people in prison over here. And, um, you know, one of the things I think most people don't understand is how for-profit of an industry the prison exactly system right. is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it blew my mind when I found out it was prisoners who were packaging um, the things you get at Victoria's Secret and how they like, yeah, all these different department stores had hired prisoners and, you know, essentially slave labor to yes. package things, yes. which, you know, I hope people understand not just how problematic that is, but why we have this cycle of prisons in this country. But exactly. never, nevertheless, all that being said, um, as you talk about book about, you know, abolishing prisons and you do talk about forgiveness and about how communities can become or elders can become uh, a better sort of touch point for us when it comes to accountability. And I guess I'm just, there's a part of me that um, I'm wondering what that looks like, because I, I gotta be honest, I think about some of the things that have happened to family members. Like I'll take my mother, for example. My mother was violently raped um, in Texas uh, years ago. They never caught the person that raped her. Yeah. And I have to say, I would be very comfortable if this person had gone to prison for the rest of their lives. So yeah. it's like, how do, dealing with the conflict of wanting people to be punished is the only better way I can think of it. And because that also brings psychological relief. Like how do you marry those two things? Yeah. Well, I, it's a great question. And it's honestly the question, these are the questions that like keep me up at night and really make me think about like what kind of world is possible and how do we, at the end of the day, when people cause real harm, um, real harm in our communities and with our family members. What do we do with them? What do we, how do we relate to them? Um, I also think about like what it would mean to heal that person. Um, the unfortunate reality is that prison doesn't actually heal. Uh, and while that one human being will be out of our lives, there's many other human beings who are doing just as harmful things. And so what does it look like to create a healing space? And, it, and, and it's an important because oftentimes when, think, when people think about healing, they're thinking at like this, you know, non-accountable, like super airy fairy place. But I, I think a lot about um, South Africa's truth and reconciliation circles and how, you know, it, it was complicated for sure, but much of that work um, that the that the government was trying to do was challenge um, the ways in which punishment had been used against um, South African people and how to have a new kind of conversation around healing, a deep kind of healing that would that means confronting the people that caused you harm and those people that have caused harm being able to be accountable for that harm that's caused and. Right now we have a system that, you know, asks strangers largely, which are cops or lawyers or judges to make that decision. But what would it mean if the community made that decision? What would it mean if the, the community culture was about, hey, first, firstly, these are things you don't do in the community. You don't murder, you don't rape, you don't steal, you don't beat. But if those things actually were to happen, what are the community consequences? And what does the community decide? And I think that's what feels most important for me around, you know, under this larger framework around abolition, which is really transformative justice. How are we transforming those conditions that many communities come from that allow for rape to happen or murder to happen, for stealing and harm to happen, for abuse to happen? And I think we have to do that work I never want to take away from people though, especially people who've been victims of, of, of violent harm, um, this idea of like, you know, I'm never going to tell someone, well, you should, I'm an abolitionist and you shouldn't be sending people to prison. Like 
it's not actually, you know, I believe in autonomy. So I'm more going to encourage people to think about what is a new way and what is what what could be possible if we tried something different. And I think that's really important. Um, we're trying to figure out how does harm not happen? And if it does happen, how do we make sure it doesn't happen again? And how do we make sure that person, the pe person who was harmed, gets the su support they need and the person who harmed also gets the su support they need? Because we forget that that person who harmed was probably already harmed or has already done harm. Um, it was probably a victim themselves and, and they need healing. There's a cycle of violence that we have to interrupt and abolition really calls for that interruption. Do you, do you think the same model um, or thought process works if we're talking about, say, you know, white domestic terrorists or people who have inflicted a lot of racial terror on our people? Is that still something that holds even when we're talking about them? It does. I know it's hard. And, you know, it's interesting because when the everything was happening with Kyle Rittenhouse um, and he obviously didn't get convicted. I remember calling a good friend of mine, Cara Page, who was actually the, 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 the person who created the term healing justice. And I was like, can you help me think about and talk about what we do with white supremacists? <laughs> what do we do with them? And of course, Black women would be the ones thinking about that because we think about everything. But she was like, yes, because I've been thinking about it too. Like, what's the answer here? And I think there's a number of things that need to happen. One is at the individual level, but also the other is at the systemic and collective le level. I'm thinking about the shooting, the shooting that just happened in Denver, the mass shooting and how the police knew about him. They, the police knew he was a known white supremacy. They had just written a book about killing the people who he killed by name. And yet they, they didn't arrest him. And so the other thing is that like the actual system in place right now doesn't protect us from white supremacists. So we have to figure out a new system. We have to figure out something that will protect us because the current system was created by them and for them.